delighted to welcome you to this first edition session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by the doll Banega Swast India. It is our pleasure today to present to you the art of bitfulness, Nandan Nilkani and Tanuj Bhojwani in conversation with Mihir S. Sharma. Veterans of the digital world, Nandan Nilkani and Tanuj Bhojwani unravel the toxic relationship we share with technology in this unprecedented digital age and offer an optimistic yet pragmatic strategies to healthier, more mindful engagement in their new book, The Art of Bitfulness. In an approach that is not anti-tech, but pro you they help reverse the blurred lines between work and home, recreation and repetition, and our lives and our screens, the boundaries necessary for time, privacy, and attention. In conversation with economist and writer, Mihir S. Sharma, Nilkani and Mojwani discuss their book and the question, if impractical to live without, how can we flourish living with technology? Nandan Nilkani is the co-founder and chairman of Infosys Technologies Limited. He was founding chairman of the Unique Identification Authority of India, a cabinet minister rank from 2009 to 2014. Most recently, Nilkani has co-founded and is chairman of the not-for-profit effort, AXTEP, working towards creating a learner-centric, technology-based platform to improve basic literacy and numeracy for millions of children. He received the Shumpeter Prize, the Padma Bhushan, and was named Businessman of the Year for 2006 by Forbes Asia, among other honors. Nilkani is the author of Imagining India, Ideas for the New Century, the co-author of Rebooting India, Realizing a Billion Aspirations with Viral Shah. Tanuj Bhujwani. Tanuj Bhujwani is a storyteller who quotes. He attended IIT Bombay as well as Ashoka University, where he studied liberal arts. His training in the sciences and humanities allows him to craft narratives about technology that are accessible without sacrificing technical depth. Bojwani is the co-author of The Art of Bitfulness with Nanda Nilkani. Mihir S. Sharma. Mihir S. Sharma is director and senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. In 2019, he co-edited What the Economy Needs Now with Abhijit Banerjee, Geeta Gopina, and Raghuram Rajan. He is also a columnist for Bloomberg in New York and an Aspen Fellow. Please feel free to send in your questions or comments by typing them in the comments section. To follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions, please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at the Lit Fest. Ladies and gentlemen, the art of bitfulness. Nanda Nilkani and Tanuj Bojwani in conversation with Mihir S. Sharma. Welcome to this uh, book launch, this virtual book launch that we're doing at the Jaipur Literature Festival. I'm Mihir Sharma and I have with me the two authors of the book, Bitfulness. Ananda Nilakani and Tanoj Bojwani. Um, and they have together collaborated on a book that attempts, in their words, to repair the relationship we have uh, with not just our devices, but also with the broader architecture of technology um, in our society. Um, in some ways, it strikes me that they've actually written two books for the price of one. Um, there's one book about how we can change our daily lives and our, our daily interaction with our devices, with our personal technology and how we manage our lives in order to be more productive in a digital world. And there's another book about how we need to restructure the rules of the digital highway, how we need to rebuild or re-regulate uh, digital infrastructure and create more digital public goods in, in a way that our relationship with um, the technological ecosystem, the big tech in general, is not Toxic. So there, there is a toxicity in both levels, internal and out, outward, private and public. And I think that 
it's those two forms of toxicity that they try to uh, try to address. Um, now, guys, uh, uh, Nanda and Tanoj, uh, we haven't talked about how we're going to divide the questions, right, uh, that I want to ask you about the book between the two of you. And it's not obvious at all uh, which section of the book has been written by Nanda and which has been written by Tanoj, right? Um, you know, I, but so whenever I ask a question, I'm going to throw it open uh, to both of you. And, um, you know, one of you can step in, whoever you think. And don't do any pehle up, you know, oh, no, I think. Nothing. Don't worry, we'll, we'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, 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 just move in. And if both of you answer, well, you know, that's, that's even better. Right. So the first question I want to ask is, um, and I want to say something first. I think it's like, it's quite clear to me that this book is, is very typical of you, Nandan. Uh, in particular, which is that it's solutions oriented, right? You've gotten a little upset with the whole idea of okay, uh, people saying tech is bad in your personal life and big tech is bad because it's evil, right? And you've got pissed off with this idea, these, these two narratives, and you said, okay, look, I need to demonstrate that there are incentive problems and there are structural problems in this relationship and there are ways in which we can fix this. Now, am I wrong? Is this, is this part no, no. of the no, totally. You know, I, I've always, you know, I've tried to be a problem solver, you know, constructive uh, solution provider. So uh, this book is about that. Uh, and to a large part, uh, I think uh, it also may, the, the, the latter part, the, the technology at the societal level is at least the digital public good stuff is based on my own experience over the last decade being part of Aadhaar and UPI and so on. And uh, on the personal use side, when Tanuj and I started writing the book, though we are 30 years apart in age, we found our philosophy was the same. Whereas I was, I of course use different physical devices for different modes and he uses the same device and he uses a lot more software to carve out his space. I, I just use hardware. I use my laptop for my uh, you know, email and work. I use my iPad for browsing and I use my phone for communication. So that's how I segregate. But the fundamental philosophy is the same. So absolutely, this book is not to point fingers or to, uh, you know, say, play a blame game. But how does one restore agency to oneself? And also, how do societies deal with something which we think is as big as the challenge of a pandemic or climate change? I'll ask Tanush to add. I think uh, we are, first of all, very kind words at the start. You summarized the book uh, excellently. So I, I feel like at that point, I should have, there's nothing to add there. Um, on, on the idea that, yeah, this is a, you're absolutely right in capturing the intent uh, of the book, which is that, um, you know, we, we, found a, we found somebody to blame, but we've not found answers, right? Uh, so this book is trying to provide those answers and say, look, how do we, number one, like you said, as an individual, how do we deal with this? Um, but uh, at the society level, I think hope is even more bleak, right? People just believe this is the way things will be. Uh, and uh, there doesn't seem to be an alternative. Uh, so we just wanted to sort of inject that hope back into the system and say, look, there are alternatives. It's, it's in fact happening right under your nose. Uh, you just have to look at them for their potential. Got it. So I want to start with um, some of the thoughts that you have uh, uh, guys on fixing our relationship that we have with our digital tools. And as you say, not spend less time necessarily with our devices because sometimes that's not an option for any of us, but to uh, spend it better. Um, now you introduce this concept um, somewhere of how essentially our smartphones or our devices are our extended mind, right? That um, most of us... and. You're correct, as you correctly point out, it's just a different form of extended mind. Ever since we started writing things, or, you know, for that matter, ever since we have uh, started telling people things, we've had extended minds, right? Uh, we've had, we've taken information and we stored it outside ourselves as well. And, and um, smartphones and devices and uh, Google, Google, et cetera, just another form of extended mind. So tell us a little bit about how we can thoughtfully design our extended mind, how, how we can you know, avoid just depending on our willpower. What are the costs of how, how we can manage procrastination? I don't go ahead. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so look, I think uh, uh, one of the similar books in this category or so people who talk about this usually come at it from the productivity angle, right? They say that, okay, how do I be more efficient or how do I do more things or how do I achieve more? Um, I think the underlying philosophy that Nandan and I found common is that you should be designing all these information devices, all of your extended mind uh, for calmness, right? And productivity will follow. 
And I think that is the the how we encapsulate what is common between how we approach this. Today, every in the attention economy, every device, every app, everybody is vying, is trying to get you to stop doing what you're doing, interrupt you, and then get you to do what they want you to do. Right? Whereas your entire purpose or your objective should be the exact opposite. That your technology are tools that that come up, you know, in place when you need them. Um, so this is the high level design principle, but you know, of course, people would want objective answers, right? How do you do this? Um, so I think the biggest thing that we're getting excellent feedback from people who are implementing. I have a 21 year old who is saying, you know, I wish I had heard this earlier. And <laughs> how much earlier does a 21 year old need to hear this? And uh, uh, you know, and and uh, so um, you know, is the idea that Nandan also talked about, which is. Uh, hey, it's, it's uh, impossible to depend on your willpower. So instead, we design our environment. So uh, Nandan, you know, this, this part from him, his favorite example is that if you go into a library, you, you know, if you want to study, you go to a library, not a bar, right? Um, so can, on your computers, on our phones, we don't have these dedicated spaces. So um, our sort of the single biggest advice we have is that create these dedicated spaces. Uh, instead of relying on willpower, your environment can be configured since it's all software, it's easy to do. Um, so you have this dedicated space where you're focused and you're writing or you're doing some important task. And at that point in time, nothing in the world can reach you. That's how you design that space, right? Just like an old private study or a library. And you have these segregations throughout, both on a, uh, you know, on where you are and what you're using, but also for a, a sense of privacy, who can reach you, who can't reach you, right? We're very blasé with our phone numbers, our email IDs, they're everywhere. And, and obviously we'll keep getting interrupted because people will reach out. But if you can create these segregations in your identity and in your workspaces, these two segregations, I think is the key uh, philosophy in the book. And, and we're all doing this to design for calm at the end of the day. I want to come, uh, come to Nandan about this in a moment, but before that, you know, I just want to ask, in your estimation, there's the fact that we've been working from home for two years, all right, most of us, and trying to, and forced with having to create different times of the day, uh, different forms of interaction uh, uh, on the basis of, uh, of, you know, just being in the same space all the time. We're not going, many of, most of us are not going to an office. We're looking at the same device. We don't have a, uh, you know, a work laptop and a home laptop uh, uh, usually sitting with us. Um, how has this made this uh, uh, particular division that you're talking about more complex or easier to implement or make the argument more immediate to people that you've talked to? Oh, this is a pandemic book. Uh, Nandan and I were both facing this problem. And I, and I think we say this and we repeat this point, not coming at it from productivity guru mindset, we will tell you how to do better. We're coming at it from people who had to struggle with this and therefore, uh, you know, looked at this problem actively, asked our friends, tried some ideas, got all that feedback and wrote a book about what helped us, right? Uh, and something like Nandan obviously has a lot more experience and therefore he's been doing this intuitively for a long time, right? So captured all of that also into it. So you're right, the pandemic does this. In fact, if anything, you know, the divide is so real that when we are on Zoom for our work calls, the top half is messed up and the bottom half may not be, right? So that keeping that boundary uh, is is really the point of all this, right? To that maintain that segregation in this environment where you can do anything at any time. We confuse that um, uh, option or possibility for necessity, and we're doing all the things all the time, right? So, uh, so to actually build that separation that was natural in the physical world. Um, you go to office, you come back from office, you're not in office, right? And you're not thinking about office. But to do that in this world requires deliberate attention and pitfulness. Nicely done, Tanush. Um, now, Nandan, Tanush is, is, is younger than you or I, right? Uh, he's grown up in a world where I think uh, uh, it becomes almost natural. You know, the, the digital world is natural for him in a way that it may not be for those of us who grew up in the in the analog uh, world. Um, talk to me a little bit about, you know, your own life. At what point did you discover that the two worlds were bleeding into each other, right? And how did... At what point did you discover that these two worlds were sort of intersecting for yourself? That you know that uh, the, your digital workspace and your digital private space had become two interspaces and you needed to find these intuitive ways that Tanuj was talking about to separate them. Well, you know, I think uh, for, for my generation, technology came over decades. I mean, uh, for me, my first desktop came probably when I was in my 40s. And then my laptop came when I was in my mid 40s. 
Uh, and that was my primary instrument. Even today for me, a laptop is where I do my email and, and, and you know, spreadsheets or writing documents. So I think that's that came first in my life. And then, of course, the mobile phone, the pre-smartphone, feature phone came, you know, when I was in my mid-40s. And I used that for 10 years. And I actually got my first smartphone only in 2010. Though Apple had launched the I, iPhone in 27. I was actually a late adop adopter of this. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and then of course I got an iPad. So I think for me, because these technologies came over li different life uh, times based on when they arrived, I could adapt them into my uh, life. But I think what I found, and the point that Tanuj is making, I found people around me were having devices and they were just all over the map. You know, they, they would be reading something and suddenly they'll get a notification, WhatsApp notification, or there'll be some Twitter and they get arguments with somebody on Twitter or whatever. I mean, you know how people are. And I was a little taken aback that the, the devices were consuming them. And I had fortunately been careful about this. I'm not on social media. I am on Twitter, but only for broadcasting my thoughts or articles. I never get into a slagging match. <coughs> And on my phone, I really, my phone is really a glorified feature phone. Because all I do on this is make phone calls and do text messages. So, I, but what I found people around, especially younger people were just, I mean, I, I've been to parties where four kids were sitting for dinner and each was on their own device. You thought that four kids at, at a dinner would be talking to each other, they're all on their own device. So I think that's when it struck me that, and then after the pandemic made it much worse because we were locked into this. We were all ordering food on the phone. We were having relationships on the device. We were you know, getting e-commerce. We were doing Zoom calls to our children. So the whole thing had become so much more. So that's when we realized that this is a serious issue that this is what we call in the third crisis in some sense. And our view is that we don't expect everyone to you know, follow everything that we're saying. We're saying this is the way it is, this is the way you can structure it. Don't, this cannot be solved by being a, a monk. You can't be a monk and say, I'll have no devices. That option is not there for us. This cannot be solved by saying, I have tremendous willpower and I'll do it, because willpower cannot overcome the addictive nature of some of these things. It's better thing is to have systems when I'm in the library, I study. When I'm in the park, I, I run. When I'm in the bar, I socialize. So I have a, in my physical world, I have cues for how I behave. So create those same cues in the digital world. Got it. Now, there, there's a lot uh, um, in this section of the book that talks about our relationship with our devices that we could go into. Uh, you know, you talk about the costs of friction. You talk about... Um, how, how to define goals, take action, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's one very nice section that I want to sort of you know, drill down on, just one of many. And it's a, it's a section where you talk about how writing is thinking, right? And um, I think that spoke to me a lot because I find that um, I can't get any clarity on an idea or on a thought unless I start writing it down. So tell us, which one of you came up with this? Was it both of you? Uh, and how, how does it impact your lives? Well, again, it's uh, uh, our approach is different. Uh, uh, I've been doing this writing thing for a long time. I, I usually have, but it's an actual physical book. I have a, a Moleskine, which I write down things. And uh, it, I put down all my deepest thoughts. I put down what I'm doing. And then I go back to it. And, you know, for example, my priorities, what I want to do, I keep going back to my priorities, which is written down. I think uh, Tanuj, so I've been doing this for a long time, uh, but Tanuj uses a more digital style. So Tanuj, you want to talk about that? Uh, no, I think, um, I mean, this section obviously it comes from both of us. I've seen Nandan writing. I've seen uh, through Nandan, you know, uh, had the chance to see uh, Bill Gates in action and, you know, in this whole meeting and his barely making eye contact with his furiously scribbling, right? Like, uh, um, uh, so I've seen this in action a lot and, and I think I only sort of started uh, putting it into practice for myself uh, a few years ago, right before uh, this book and etc., and it really caused this transformation, right? So um, where I could see that I had more clarity of thought, I could articulate what I'm uh, thinking better because I had practiced thinking, right? When you write or when you take an idea and you put it down, the the way that I now look at it is just, this is actually thinking, and this is iteration of thought. You write down, you know, draft one. 
then you go back and look at what you've read, read what you've written and correct it. And that's draft two. And as you're doing that, you're also improving the quality of that thought in your head. Um, and so for, because I think it's, it's for sort of, uh, you know, it was more recent for me. So I think um, for Nandan is just an embedded system and, and through the people that I meet through him also, I see um, this in action. So it just was this uh, insight that we wanted to share, you know, uh, I think. Like, also, you should tell her how you use a tool. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, sorry. I was, uh, so in the, so in a lot of the things in the book are also about um, uh, new digital note-taking systems. I think there's been a renaissance in the pandemic, especially, I think, because I'm guessing when you're anxious, one of the best things is that, you know, that blank page and putting your thoughts down there and using your thoughts, uh, using the tool as a journal. And uh, like you were saying, right, it is true that for my age, my first thought is not to go buy a notebook. It is to find an app uh, which will do this, right? So uh, uh, the new age apps that we have, which have these linked or network thinking stuff, we've brought in some of those concepts because um, it, once you write down, the second part of this is, do you ever retrieve this? You know, the act of writing itself is helpful, meditative but being able to then um, link those thoughts and use them in the future uh, is like a superpower, right? And and that really makes it very powerful. So we've given some advice on that in the book. Too much to uh, download here, but it's there. No, oh, yes, and that's a, it's a very interesting section. I myself, my, my wife, for example, um, is old school and has a bullet journal, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of these ways of, of keeping track. I've tried to find an app uh, that does the same thing. I haven't quite found it. But... I, I keep on hoping for the ideal. In fact, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Nandan writing because the first time, I, I think it must be 13 years ago, Nandan, when did you write uh, Imagining India? 2008? Yeah, 2008, yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, hang on, that is that 13? Yeah, well, it's, it's uh, well, I can't, I don't even want to think about how, how long ago it was. But um, that was the first time I met Nandan and I walked in, you know, to talk to him about his book, Tanuj, and I was carrying my notebook and I sat down. And the first thing he did was he took out his notebook and he started writing down my questions as I asked them, right? Um, <laughs> this really was such an unusual reaction, you know, to have from someone. He's like, you know, that's a good point. Let me, you know, it was <laughs> quite uh, was, interesting. Was that in the Taj Man Singh? Where did we meet first time? It was in uh, Nandan. It was in the Taj Man Singh. I think it was in the, uh, uh, you know, chambers or something like that. I can't Yeah, remember. yeah. <laughs> Can I use this opportunity to ask a question on what just happened, right? To Nandan, my question to you is that he has a terrific memory, right? Like these small things, this little detail just now, he always does. Right? Do you think Nandan writing helps with that? No, see, I, I, I use the writing to offload stuff. So I, I put important things in writing and keep uh, trivial things in my memory, like where I met Mihir the first time. So I guess it's it's a very weird style, but or I, basically I don't I don't load too much into my short term memory. My long term memory I keep, but short term memory I download. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense and uh, um, how to operate because otherwise organizing, there are people, I think we've all met these people who have these enormous, incredible mind trees and their ability to um, organize things in the mind. But that's a much harder task in today's yeah, world yeah. when there is uh, there are options available to us to organize our extended mind, which is what yeah. we uh, And I think, uh, Mihir, the important thing is if you do this, then you your mind can roam around. You know, for me, the ability to roam around my mind and suddenly some synapse happens and I connect two dots. And for you also in your career as a writer, the ability to connect dots is very important. And I find if you offload all this into writing, then you can the mind can be roamed freely. Exactly, because I think the competitive advantage of the human mind right now is not in retention of information. Exactly. Connecting, connecting with information. And so we need to, to make sure it is uh, performing its most... Uh, uh, competitively advantageous. Uh, Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, right. So I think we talked a bit about this sort of private thing. Let's move to the, the public larger scale idea here. And so let me again sort of try and summarize it fully. Um, but one of the ways that you're talking about, you say that we can fix our personal habits and that's, but in the, in, in some sense, that's fixing the symptom, right? You're, you're treating the symptom. Let's look at the disease and you may have this, you have a bunch of, good examples in demonstrating how our toxic personal relationship with whether it is social media or the internet is actually, um, you know, a feature of how large companies have designed uh, these things. And it is a feature of how they themselves operate of their own incentives. And it may not be that they are, you know, set up by evil people who want to ruin our lives, but it is how the choices that you make as a struggling entrepreneur, when you seek out your VC, 
when you uh, uh, choose scale over over you know user satisfaction <laughs> you know these are things that are uh, uh, are in, you're incentivized to do as an entrepreneur and then that structures over time how society's interaction with technology actually uh, develops um and you talk about how we, how we are going digital is going to lead to an imbalance of power um, but there's this lovely section, actually, which I think would only have come from people who are actually, uh, you know, steeped both in the history of the internet and are not automatically trained to think of entrepreneurship or business as evil, where you uh, explain uh, what the original sin of the internet was. And I think that's, that's something that I that really spoke to me and I hadn't thought of it before. Uh, so, so uh, guys, tell me, what is the original sin of the internet? Well, I think, uh, again, I'll start and I'll have Tanuj uh, come in. I think the original say of the internet was there was no business model for the internet. The internet was designed not by businessmen. It was designed by well-meaning technologists funded by the Defense Department. And they were really focused on creating this interoperable network where you could connect. And they did a phenomenal job. And when what happened was up till, you know, up till about 95, the internet was really like that. And then the World Wide Web was uh, created by Tim Berners-Lee in 91, 92. Then uh, Mark Anderson created Mosaic, a browser, which made it very simple to use in 94. He moved to the Valley in 95, joined Jim Clark and set up Netscape. After that, it became a very different internet with commercial things. And then people realized that there was no way to make money. So the only way to make money was digital advertising. And remember, in America, advertising was a few hundred billion dollar industry in television, in print, and so on. And the ability to take that to internet, but advertising required attention, required targeting, and so on. So I think that's how, and therefore, that's how the whole attention economy came about. Tanuj? Business models per se aren't, I mean, that's one problem, but specifically, I think one more feature uh, that that if we could have done, then somebody else could have made a business model, like a precursor to the business model missing could have been a way to pay online. Because if people could simply transfer money over the internet, which, you know, they couldn't do. And in fact, honestly, all the ways to do it were terrible till about say, like we've had a UPI and you know, the mobile payment experience, I would say in 2015 over the internet, finally, uh, 15, 16, uh, improved enough for it to actually be satisfactory and the usage has now gone exponential. Uh, because there was no way to, uh, you can share information peer to peer and that was radical, that was very, very new. But because there was no way to send money from one place to another, um, uh, that you know was was what led to not having the uh, business model and then that led to advertising. So yeah, the, that moment when they chose advertising is the original sin. Uh, but the preconditions, one of the when we talk about is no way to pay. Um, and, and there were two other things, Mehir, which happened in 1996, the U.S. passed the Communication Decency Act, which gave, uh, you know, Section 230 of the, essentially said, there's no consequential liability for the platforms for any content. And that was a slippery slope because if a social media platform had all kinds of stuff on it, then there was no liability. And whereas if you run a newspaper, you're liable under some censorship laws and so on. And today we are seeing the consequence of that where, you know, all this fake news and this and that. So I think that law also gave a pass on content. And then, of course, there was the whole issue of uh, uh, in net neutrality, which allowed people to ride on top of infrastructure built by others. So a number of things all happened to create this situation. I, no, no, I think that, you know, the interesting thing about Section 230, and this is taking us to our... Uh, um, the final point, which is about infrastructure and public goods. The interesting thing about Section 230 is that when we first used to hear about this argument, it was to, it was to protect ISPs, to protect the builders of the of the structure. You know, is that IS, the internet service provider should not be like a newspaper, should not be like a publisher, because they're just building the you know the tubes. The internet is a set of tubes, and they're building the tubes, and they can't control what uh, uh, what flows through them. But that argument for the ISP is now applied to giant platforms, which are much closer to newspapers and publishers than the, you know, than the ISP was. So that 230 argument was one for ISPs, maybe on the right thing, but it, you know, it has now been extended to another set of players. And you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, this point about micropayments is great because it, 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 it tells you, um, uh, it gives, gets to the heart of what happens when tech meets business. Right when idealistic tech guys meet hard-headed business guys, so the tech guys came in and said, "We are creating a system by, where you know data can flow seamlessly, and where individuals, as Sanal said, you can get P2P micro you know uh, micro connections, 
but I can't get P2P micropayments. And uh, so there is no, you know, if I want to give away data free, then the internet is the perfect location. If I want someone to pay for my thoughts, the internet is the worst location. And, you know, those two things have just collided in the, in, 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 in the situation in which we now find ourselves, in which any creator is at the mercy of a platform and any consumer is at the mercy of a platform. Right. So let's move to this platform discussion. And it, again, this is great in this book because um, most books that talk about the regulation of big tech start from the assumption that they are malignant and malicious, uh, 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 you know, and we need to be able to fix them in some way. Uh, now, you also want to fix them in some way, but you explain that it's not about who's running them. It's not about, uh, you know, the, the, the malignance of the, of the entire corporate structure. It, in, it is built into how they are financed and the choices that they have to make in order to be profitable. So talk us through that idea. Talk us through how scale uh, leads to this. The search for scale leads to some of the problems we face. Well, you know, I think uh, a lot of it also has to do with uh, venture capital and capital markets and the whole winner-take-all philosophy that uh, has been articulated by people like Peter Thiel and uh, others, which is that the only good game is a the only good company is a monopoly company, right? So the fundamental idea is that you become so big that nobody else can take your place. And because of network effects, it's very difficult to break into that. For tomorrow, today, for example, you, you may keep on railing against WhatsApp, but it's highly unlikely that you will use Signal or Telegram because the other guy doesn't have Signal or Telegram. So network effects are very uh, are very critical. And the combination of network effects and scale creates moats in some sense. That's the language of these guys. But I think uh, that's why we say that interoperability and portability is very important. And uh, uh, you know, e email is a good example. Email still has the original internet philosophy where it uses a common protocol, SMTP protocol. And therefore, if I'm using Gmail and you may be using a Hotmail, he may be using Yahoo, it doesn't matter to any of us because our mails go to each other because there's a common protocol. And that's that's the kind of thing we need. And when, when the UPI was designed, it was actually using the email as a role model. How do we make payments be interoperable without worrying whether it came from a Google Pay or a WhatsApp Pay? So I think interoperability, portability of data, reducing switching costs, these are all important things. And you know we have them in other markets. In, in stock markets, we have interoperability. In airlines, we can create a PNR which combines three different airlines. You do code sharing. All that is only possible because all of them speak a common language across uh, businesses. And we have to do something similar here. And I'm going to follow up on that thought about interoperability in a minute, but um, I want to just say that uh, Nandan, uh, one of the way, one of the few uh, text-based uh, uh, messaging systems um, that doesn't have interoperability, that is email but a walled garden, is Bloomberg Messenger, right? And um, you know, I I write for Bloomberg, and I know uh, you know that this is a company that makes a lot of money, and they make a lot of money because uh, in in order to be able to message someone in that financial world, you have to get onto that platform, and they have a moat. They have an e you know it is like email, you know Bloomberg Messenger, uh, uh, instant Bloomberg as they call it, serves as a moat, and it and they make profits off that moat. It is it is it continues to be vital. Uh, so even in email, you know there is this one location where uh, uh, in within finance where you can where you see. Yeah, well, it's, it's you know it, it, there are now a lot of messaging. Uh, I mean, like uh, uh, you know, like Discord and all. They, they are also you know creating their own wall gardens. But you're right. Uh, but uh, if you take traditional email, I meant the yeah. email of uh, what most people use. It's completely interoperable. So on interoperability, and and um, I think this is where we have to get into the question of what your concept is about digital public goods. And you know, uh, Tanuji worked for iSpirit. Nandan, you were involved in in designing the you know original architecture that a lot of this is built on. Um, how do you think India has done on creating these public goods that you know either induce or force interoperability on uh, you know on on some of the participants in these sectors and. Uh, in fact, what's the relationship between inducement, incentivization, and forcing them? You know that because and what? Uh, and, you know what is the where does regulation become? Uh, yeah. You know, re, you know, regulate get onto this as we've done with some of the UPI stuff. Yeah. Where is inducement, like this, will be good for you. You know, yeah. 
how do you create no, that yeah, no, I think designing digital public goods is a very, uh, it's a very, uh, a lot of judgment is involved because you have to figure out what should be the common rails, where should the interoperable, but also you should know when to stop. You should make it minimalistic enough for innovation to happen on top of that. And the original internet had those features also. So in UPI, the focus on making sure that the payments were interoperable, but it could be from any bank account to any other bank account. It could be from any mobile app to any mobile app. And that is where, you know, design becomes so important. Architecture becomes uh, so important. And I think in India, we've done a pretty good job, whether it's identity, uh, whether it's payments, whether it is uh, account aggregator system, which has just been launched, which allows people to use their own data going forward. Uh, a lot of, lot, of, lot of the platforms being built in India are, are broadly following these principles, but it requires the conditions for this to happen are not very common. It requires government, market operators, regulators, technologists to come together, trust each other to design a minimalistic system that gives competitive, uh, you know, competition among players. So it's not easy to replicate it, but I think India has done a fairly good job. And I would think that over time, the Indian model will become uh, become more uh, more uh, more apparent to people. And the other thing, and since we are in the since we are in the Ukraine Russia thing, is you know if financial systems are weaponized, then all the more you realize that you need to create an interoperable financial system where you know you're not you're not in another wall garden. I mean you're not on Swift, and then you're off Swift means you can't do very LCs. So I think uh, weaponization will further makes the will brings out the point that we need interoperable technology where switching is easy. I, I think that's a very uh, good point and it's very current. I mean, I think a lot of people are deeply concerned. I mean, we may agree with the the way that SWIFT has been used on this occasion, but the principle is, is far more problematic, that you need to be able to create a, a system that uh, allows people to continue to use it, which is decentralized enough in some yes. sense. Um, and that, that you can't leave the power to make these decisions in a few hands. Yes. And, uh, 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 to what degree has your experience working in Icebridge creating these, uh, you know, the uh, 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 you know uh, the stacks that India has, uh, the India stack uh, system, has it experienced your thinking about? It? Uh, has it influenced your thinking about uh, regulation in this? I mean, uh, to, to objectively answer that question, or facetiously answer that question is very simple. You say, you know, what is your scale? If it's one to ten, it's eleven, right? Like it's very clear. I came here, I met these people, and. Look, I, um, in fact, I come from this, your classic startup EOP background, right? Um, if if I hadn't crossed paths with this team and what the work has been happening here, uh, I would have probably been making, you know, sharing uh, Shark Tank memes right now, right? Like, that's who I am. But uh, there is a something very special happening in Bangalore. Uh, which is that people are, you know, people who are in tech, people who are usually often criticized for being the same techno optimistic or, you know, like painted in that same broad stroke because you're unwilling to actually get into the nuance and listen, right? But if you do get into that nuance and listen, you realize something special is happening in Bangalore, not just an ice spirit. There are multiple organizations, back in Xtep, uh, that are looking to solve, use technology for the public good by building them as public goods, right? It's it's phenomenal what's happening. It's phenomenal what's happening from here. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, sort of my experience here meeting all these people in all these organizations has completely reshaped how I approach the technology startup world altogether. Right, and I think we're almost at the end, and, and that's, that's, that's a wonderful uh, uh, way to uh, conclude by talking about how it's very interesting that there is an ecosystem developed. It's not just about uh, finding your quick... Uh, you know, finding your VC guy and then your quick payout when they exit, right? It's it's not just about that. There is a, there is a group of people that are that are discovering ways in which uh, you know the ingenuity of the tech uh, uh, ecosystem in Bangalore can be put to use for the broader public good in 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 building these public goods. And and then you've had a large role to play uh, in creating this ecosystem. I, I I think that both Tanoj and I can can say that uh, you know this has been one of the things that you've been quietly working on for you know uh, more than a decade. Um, are you satisfied with how it's turning out with the number of young people that are interested in this or the number of new ideas that are that are emerging from this, you know, ideas which are not all yours. I mean, they're, they're, they may be bubbling up in different directions, but, but it's, it's an yeah. ecosystem that are handed well, creating. Well, what I think is that the number of people 
thinking of and architecting these digital public goods is relatively smaller compared to the total number of technology people. So uh, these are people who have believe in this or who have achieved financial self-sufficiency or believe that they can do that later in life and help in doing this or whatever. And I think we also have great organizations like NPCI in Bombay, which is really implemented a lot of these phenomenal payment systems, UID as in Delhi. So it's really, uh, you know, many, many actors in that. So I think it's a, uh, it's still, uh, we're only halfway on the journey. So yes, the last decade or 14 years, 13 years, we've done a lot of things, but the, I think the next decade is going to be very powerful. Account aggregator will come online. The, you know, the health uh, records will become completely portable. Education will be uh, portable and both offline and online. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the whole skills will become, your skill credential will become portable. For example, you know, what we have done in uh, vaccine certificates, no other country has done this. We have a portable interoperable vaccine certificate, which can be verified online or offline using QR codes and digital signatures. Whereas if you go to the US, they still give you a piece of paper on which they write down your vaccination certificate status. So I think we have leapfrogged in many ways and it's not obvious to people that actually these things are very, very things. So yes, I would say halfway there, a lot more to do. Wonderful. And I think that uh, uh, that's a nice sort of optimistic uh, place in which to end this, that we know that stuff is happening, that there are solutions to be found in what can be toxic relationships. And uh, But those solutions depend, I think, on a lot of us uh, rolling our sleeves up and uh, getting down to work, not just in our own lives, in repairing relationships, but also in, in creating these structures. And thanks. Thanks, both of you, for doing that and writing this book. Thanks. Thanks, May. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Mihir. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, our host and JLF for doing yeah, this. And Jaipur Lit Fest, it's great to be there to launch this book. Thank you all. And um, thank you, JLF. Thank you, Nandan, Tanoj, Mihir, for that fascinating conversation. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay logged on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Frontlawn, Mughal Tent, and Darbar Hall. Stay tuned for the next session.